Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Theological Genealogies of Modernity Conference. Um, this is day three of our events. We've had um, two really interesting days uh, leading up to today. So we're um, building off of that momentum and we have some excellent material uh, scheduled for today as well. Let me just give you a word about our format um, and then we'll dive into our uh, first session. So each of our hours for the conference is broken down into four parts. Um, our presenter will give a paper summary, um, not a full paper, but a paper summary. And then we'll have a respondent uh, respond to that paper. The uh, presenter will have a chance to reply. And then we'll bring in all of the people who are speaking on that day, and they will be able to um, ask questions or make comments about the topic that's being discussed. And in the final section of each hour, um, we'll have questions from our audience. So um, if you're an attendee out there and you have a question that you would like to um, pose to those who are speaking, whenever that occurs to you, um, just pop it in the uh, Q&A button that you see at the bottom of your screen. Just type out the question, it will come through to us, and then we will um, we'll pose as many of those questions to our speakers as we can. Um, the, because of the format that we're using, we're not going to be uh, circulating the full versions of the papers that our uh, presenters are giving. The, um, the papers will eventually come out in publication. They'll come out um, in revised versions in a journal called Modern Theology. So do look for those um, in due course, but for now um, we're giving these summaries, refining ideas and, and moving forward in that way. Um, okay, so our first session today, we have um, our speaker as Joel Rasmussen. Um, so Joel is associate professor of 19th century Christian thought um, in the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of Oxford. Joel is a former colleague of mine. Um, so he has authored a monograph on Kierkegaard and edited several works in the area of modern Christian theology. Um, he's currently also working on a synthetic project called Christianity and the Cultures of Modernity. So we're all looking forward to that book um, when it comes out. But uh, today we'll be um, hearing from Joel on a more targeted topic. So I will uh, turn over to him. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. And thank you also, Pui, um, for the invitation uh, to present today. Um, my title is either Nietzsche or Aristotle, question mark, um, McIntyre's modernity and the enduring relevance of Kierkegaard. And some people might recognize in that title um, a combination of both Kierkegaard and McIntyre's um, texts in as much as obviously either or is uh, Kierkegaard's first major publication, but um, less well known perhaps is that deep within um, McIntyre's work entitled After Virtue is a chapter entitled Nietzsche or Aristotle question um, mark. And my uh, paper addresses uh, McIntyre's reading of Kierkegaard's either or in After Virtue and uh, maybe somewhat against the grain of the uh, dominant strain of this conference. Um, the upshot of my paper is that um, this reading might, even, might well call into question um, all of our genealogies, uh, certainly the theological genealogies of modernity, um, whether of an Enlightenment progressive sort or a, a declension sort, or even in the mode which is perhaps most famous, namely the, the Nietzschean uh, mode. Um, so in critical conversation with what McIntyre calls Kierkegaard's doctrine, um, I want to suggest that what we can learn from Kierkegaard has been and ought to be of enduring relevance for what McIntyre calls tradition-informed philosophical and theological um, thinking in modernity. But I don't begin the essay with after virtue or either or in fact, but rather with um, McIntyre's uh, 
volume maybe two two years later, three years later, I think, um, three rival versions of modernity, because there he lays out very schematically um, his conception of three main mutually exclusive um, intellectual orientations available to us in modern culture. Namely, these are what he calls uh, the encyclopedic rationality of Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment thinkers, the genealogical theorizing of uh, Derrida and, uh, sorry, um, um, Nietzsche and post-Nietzschean thinkers, such as Jacques Derrida, Haldeman, and made most famously in terms of genealogy, perhaps Michel Foucault, and then um, uh, McIntyre's own tradition-informed Thomistic um, point of view, which is supposed to synthesize um, Aristotelian and Augustinian commitments. Um, this is somewhat after his own um, reception into the Catholic Church, where the, the, his Thomism becomes more, much more robust um, and the Aristotelianism becomes maybe downplayed, except in so far as Thomas is synthesizing Aristotle with an Augustinianism. And these three main orientations, um, he locates very specifically in three um, texts of the 19th century, namely the Encyclopedia, uh, the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Nietzsche's uh, On the Genealogy of Morality, obviously, and Pope Leo XIII's encyclical. Eternis, Eterni Patris. Um, so basically, just very rough and ready sketch, the encyclopedic model is that which comes to the fore in the Enlightenment, post-Enlightenment, with the ideal of knowledge as fairly disembodied, value neutral and objective. Uh, what's true is true regardless of when it was thought and who, who thought it and what tradition it's a part of. And if this can be, um, in, uh, categorized in encyclopedia entries, and then you have a comprehensive vision of what uh, of truth. Um, the genealogical, obviously, is ready to hand already by the time the ninth edition is published, because Nietzsche is already, uh, well, no, that's not quite right, but um, right around the same time, Nietzsche publishes on the genealogy of modernity, which points out really that all knowledge is, um, if it's knowledge at all, is perspectival, and it does matter who says it and when and how it's come into, into being. Um, and then uh, in agreement with that perspectival um, notion is the tradition informed position of his own uh, uh, Thomism, of McIntyre's own Thomism, um, but in disagreement with Nietzschean, it, it actually has some notion of a transcendent truth to which all our knowledge claims are accountable and which, te which tests them. And all our knowledge claims arising out of some perspective um, are accountable to each other in a dialectic um, across centuries informed by the tradition, which Nietzsche, of course, wishes to deconstruct. Um, but in that deconstruction, McIntyre thinks, and, and the desire to create and recreate oneself, to live, uh, to make, uh, what, make of one's life literature, really, um, the, the Nietzschean genealogist and the post-Nietzschean genealogist like Foucault um, have a volatile self insofar as their self is never, never continuous enough with itself to become itself. And so it, 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 it's deconstructive. And that's the tradition informed critique of, of, of the Nietzschean genealogy, right? So now turn to, turn back really to after virtue. Um, in after virtue, McIntyre, um, Tells us tells a st story where where these there are these uh, um, alternative op opportunities for us to again. It's a, but it, he's not made his own Thomistic turn, but still he's an Aristotelian. He's advocating for an Aristotelian because uh, Aristotle gives us um, a, this sort of dialectical in accountability to each other to working out the truth. That if we don't have that, then we're ultimately ending up Nietzscheans. Is is the overall trajectory of of the work. But within that trajectory, he plots, um, of course, Enlightenment figures and then Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard is either or in particular, which in the wake of, of, of Kant's turn to the subject, um, McIntyre says, stands for us as 
the outcome and epitaph of the Enlightenment project to ground morality independently of traditions, to give a perfectly rational grounding for morality. Um, and it's this work that's supposed to, that either or is supposed to be the outcome and epitaph of that project. And I found that very strange. And I still find that a very strange um, claim because I read either or very, very differently than, than he does. Let me check the time. Um, I think I'm only supposed to have 15 minutes for this, aren't I, Darren? Uh, um, yes, that sounds right, but you're doing fine. Halfway through. Okay. Okay. Um, either or um, is famously comprised of two major volumes. It's edited by a pseudonymous ed editor, Victor Arameta. In the first volume, we have a jumbled set of letters, papers of the aesthete and uh, a seducer named Johannes. We never know the aesthete's name. It was just known as A. Um, and in and these are sort of wonderfully literary pyrotechnics. But the, but in and through these writings, the aesthete is trying to um, create himself. He's tr he's trying to perfect the art of living poetically. He tells us. Um, and this is characterized as the aesthetic point of view. In volume two, we have two very long letters um, by a figure named William, Judge William, um, who is writing to the aesthete. We never have letters back from the aesthete to ju the judge, but we have these very long letters um, where he's commending to the aesthete the ethical, the ethical form of life over and against his merely aesthetic existence, because it's only through the ethical that you can consolidate your life. If you're constantly creating and recreating um, the, oneself, um, then you never consolidate yourself enough to even have a self. And you also aren't accountable to others in the way you develop yourself. And you're not accountable for any notion, criterion of some higher truth. There is no, there's really no such thing. It's a, he's given up on it. And Kierkegaard himself thinks that first, the aesthete is modeled on um, romantic irony, um, which is what he had, had worked his um, his thesis written, written his thesis on the concept of irony with continual reference to Socrates. Um, the Socratic ironic is is controlled irony. He says there irony in service of a transcendent truth or good, which is unassimilable and never knowable but which is nonetheless there and is to which we're accountable. Whereas the romantic irony is irony off the rails. It's constant creation and, and, and self recreation um, because one's given up on any notion of a transcendent truth. Um, so, right. Um, McIntyre has no real problem actually in, in, in with, with with the A figure, insofar as the, the depiction, his real problem, he recognizes that there are such figures. McIntyre's real um, problem and where he challenges either or is that he thinks what William recommends to A is a criterionless choice. A choice without criterion, it makes choice arbitrary. And, and so you just are, so are to choose yourself. And this is what is the outcome and epitaph of modernity running aground because if there's nothing to choose from because you don't have you're not appealing to the traditions you're only appealing to your own rational resources and once you've deconstructed rationality as the romantic irony has done and i'm saying also affiliating that romantic irony with the nietzschean genealogical perspective once you've affiliated those you have no self upon which to build and then there's the third moment and i'm really aware of the time here um there's a further irony in the either or, and that is at the end of his second letter, William encloses a sermon that has been written by um, a pastor on the Jutland Heath. Um, and William says, I give you this because this says better than I've been able to say in these last 400 pages, what I've wanted to say all along. Um, and I think the irony is in fact that the sermon ironizes William's own self-complacency, his own confidence in, in his own outlook because the, the sermon addresses over and again, 26 times, the, the, the claim that in relationship to God, we are always in the wrong. 
in relationship to God. We are always all any of the any of the stories we tell. And so confession is the appropriate religious outlook. And I suggest that this is a hermeneutic for Kierkegaard's subsequent authorship. But I only briefly touch on that toward the end because my essay itself, like this um, summary, perhaps. Um, went over what was requested, it went a bit long. So I wasn't able to develop that because Kierkegaard's authorship is vast, but that confessional penitential outlook with which either or ends, um, I think both is to relativize the aesthetes self-creations and also relativize the kind of confidence with which the judge recommends his tradition informed Aristotelian um, outlook on life. Um, oh, I'm only I'm getting a three minute warning now, so I have a bit more time to go. I, I thought I was up. Um, um, so for the further three minutes, I have a coda on my in, in my essay, um, where after, after having said, I think this um, confessional penitential outlook um, relativizes all of our genealogies, the confidence with which we narrate history, if we think we're narrating them theologically as though we know um, how God envisions history to, to develop in any time and place, um, we might nonetheless um, keep Kierkegaard as a um, important, enduringly relevant theological and philosophical, philosophical interlocutor, because um, if the desideratum of McIntyre, for example, is that um, we combine the dialectic of a Socrates, a Plato, and an Aristotle, the confessional outlook of uh, uh, Augustine, the move from confession back to dialectic in Anselm, and then the constant oscillation between dialectic and, um, and confession that we find in Thomas Aquinas, well then I, I find Kierkegaard himself to be um, Socratic, Socratically dialectical and as Socratically dialectical and confessionally Christian as any modern thinker there is. And because he's a modern thinker, Kierkegaard is arguably more equipped to help us address some of the problems of modernity that um, Thomas Aquinas, uh, important as a thinker as he was and remains, is not able to address. So I think that probably should do it in, in terms of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joel. Um, you've given us a very conscientious reading of Kierkegaard from which some, some very significant points have, have emerged. Um, so we will um, get our initial formal response uh, from Professor Thomas Fow, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, but I want to also renew my offer to anyone out in the audience. Um, if you have questions, if what's being said is prompting questions from you, um, go ahead and put them right in that Q&A feature and we'll see if we can integrate them into the discussion. Um, so Thomas Fow is the Alice Mary Baldwin Distinguished Professor of English um, at Duke University. And he also holds secondary appointments in German um, and at Duke's Divinity School. He's written Many books, um, among the most relevant for our conference theme, are Minding the Modern uh, from 2013, his own sort of genealogical account of modernity. And he has a new book uh, focusing on phenomenology of image, image consciousness in literature, theology, and philosophy. And I think we're expecting the publication of that book this year or next year. Um, so we, we look forward to that um, and also to hearing now um, what he thought of Joel's reflections on McIntyre and Kierkegaard. So over to uh, Thomas Fowle. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to uh, be part of this event and um, to Joel for his paper, which I found uh, very lucid and um, throughout long stretches very persuasive. Um, I will read my response in the hope that that will actually keep me in the time limit um, and protect me from my instinct to embroider in ways that would likely run over. Um, so um, that'll make it a little more formal, but I trust it's better that way. 
so I want to uh, just first of all acknowledge that uh, as far as uh, Joel Rasmussen's uh, account of McIntyre's reading of either or uh, is concerned, I find myself really pretty much entirely in agreement with the way it's uh, argued and structured. And uh, initially want to just offer a couple of amendments, uh, entirely friendly, uh, designed to underscore just how different both in rhetorical approach and conceptual intent uh, Kierkegaard's book is from the Enlightenment project with which McIntyre tries to identify it. Following that, I want to put some pressure on Joel Rasmussen's account of Nietzsche in relation to romantic irony. And then uh, finally, I want to speculate a bit more liberally where, uh, about where Joel Rasmussen's uh, brief concluding remarks might take us. So um, perhaps even more than Joel, I confess to being rather dissatisfied or even perplexed with McIntyre's decision to situate either or in the narrative tradition of Diderot's Rameau's nephew and Henry James's portrait of a lady, the text that McIntyre uh, presents as points of reference, um, both on stylistic grounds and also on historical grounds uh, Kierkegaard's uh, supremely self-conscious seducer is, I think, far more plausibly associated with works like La Clos' Liaison Dangereuse, Mozart's Don Giovanni, obviously a reference point for this book, uh, Schlegel's Lucinda, which Joel Rasmussen also mentions. Uh, I'm also thinking of Stendhal's Le Rouge et Le Noir, and uh, particularly of Goethe's Elective Affinities. And I mentioned these texts for two reasons. First of all, um, not only does part one of either or continue these works diagnosis of a fatally self-conscious and deracinated eroticism, but like Mozart and Goethe, Kierkegaard's analyses, I think, are meant to gauge whether under conditions of modernity, ethical community is still possible. Not without significant debt to Hegel, as Joel Rasmussen's opening pages show, uh, Kierkegaard frames the question of an inoperative or operative community as a dialectical confrontation between late 18th century sentimentalism, a proto-existentialist naturalism, uh, pioneered perhaps by La Maitrie, a Helvetius, a Priestley, um, and uh, finally, Judge Williams' reaffirmation of bourgeois Sittlichkeit, to use the Hegelian term, which is to say as a coefficient of religious tradition, civic institutions, and bourgeois habits. Now, notably, neither sentimentalism, naturalism, nor bourgeois moral theory can bridge the conceptual chasm that separates it from the other two. And that leaves us with a classic instance of what McIntyre would call incommensurability. Now, as far as uh, Joel Rasmussen's account of Nietzsche is concerned, I admit to being somewhat less at ease with uh, his reading of Nietzschean genealogy as a quote, ironic parody of the infinite absolute negativity of romantic irony. Uh, repeatedly, I find uh, you know, Joel Rasmussen equate the exuberant wit of Jena with the prophet rhetorician from Sils Maria, such as when he speaks of, quote, romantic or Nietzschean irony, uh, or when associating, quote, Nietzsche's aphoristic nihilism with the ironic detachment of Kierkegaard's seducer. And finally, when referring to Kierkegaard's uh, aesthetes, proto-Nietzschean stance of self-invention. Putting it thus, I think, risks conflating what I at least would take to be two distinct and in some respects sharply divergent projects. Thus, uh, Schlegel's concept of irony uh, remains firmly committed to a Socratic ideal of knowing by means of ever-increasing reflexivity. By contrast, Nietzschean genealogy dismisses such reflexivity as ultimately epiphenomenal to our atavistic drives and our entanglements in a kaleidoscopic perspectivism, which is to say as a case of irremediable self-deception. To be sure, the, genealogist attempt, uh, his, uh, the uh, genealogist's attempted unmasking of all received norms and values would seem to require a vantage point no longer implicated in the languages of classical realism, romantic sentimentalism, or speculative dialectics. 
And yet, rather like the fought da game of Freud's little hands, the Nietzschean genealogist remains obsessively attached to what he purports to disavow. Ironic detachment hardly seems the characterization of it. In fact, as Nietzsche's rhetorical hyperventilations grow more fantastic and his anti-metaphysical pathos more hyperbolic, evidence mounts that his project remains dependent, indeed, as Mercantile would call it, parasitical, on the metaphysical faith that he means to dismantle. Ultimately, Nietzschean genealogy turns out to be animated by a wholly unironic commitment to a metaphysics of truth, a point made at great length by Heidegger in his 1936 through 1940 lectures. For Nietzsche's aspiration to emancipate his contemporaries from their metaphysical presuppositions and commitments is no mere performative happening or ironic burlesque in the manner of Cervantes or Friedrich Schlegel. On the contrary, it is an all-encompassing undertaking to the realization of which he is absolutely committed. For it to have any chance at success, Nietzsche's genealogical project must exempt itself from the hermeneutics of suspicion that it brings to bear on any number of truth claims. Indeed, what Joel Rasmussen calls, quote, the emancipatory power of genealogy that might liberate us from the deceptions of ressentiment and the will to truth remains grounded in a conception of the true after all. Indeed, far more so than the virtuoso irony of, say, Jean Paul Siebenkäs or Friedrich Schlegel's Athenaeum fragments. For the genealogist's dismantling of inherited moral and intellectual frameworks, presupposes a terminus ad quem, a non-contingent truth, however oblique and likely unattainable, begging to be realized by the proposed thorough transvaluation, umwertung of all traditional values and norms. As Nietzsche writes, uh, Zarathustra's, and here I quote, Zarathustra's experimental refutation of the presupposition that the world is a moral order, dass die Welt sittlich geordnet sei, reaches its apotheosis in this. Zarathustra is, above all, more truthful, wahrhaftiger, than any other thinker, inasmuch as he represents, and again I quote, the self-abolition of morality from the vantage point of truth, die Selbstüberwindung der Moral aus Wahrhaftigkeit. Now, to return to Kierkegaard's book, the central question raised by Joel Rasmussen's paper appears to me to involve what he calls a, quote, third position, outlines of which we glimpse as Kierkegaard responds to the false choice between a romantic aesthetics of irony and a Hegelian Protestant Sittlichkeit with a resounding neither nor. Leaving aside whether these two positions are quite as fungible with Aristotle and Nietzsche as Joel Rasmussen suggests, the pivotal issue I, I take to be how we are to understand this third option. Yet here, unlike the gadfly of Copenhagen, Joel Rasmussen offers us only the barest intimations of when that third option consists. Safe to note that an alternative to McIntyre's version of moral inquiry is modeled in many of Kierkegaard's works after either or. Quite so. But surely the question then becomes whether the robustly normative account of Christian life and community found in, say, the sickness unto death and practice in Christianity is still an instance of genealogical critique, or at least is still answerable to a Nietzschean counter genealogy. Notably, the later Kierkegaard seems no longer concerned with exposing the internal contradictions of the sentimental, ironic, and liberal bourgeois paradigm. Writing in that most fraught year of 1848, he thus offers only a few passing jabs at, quote, the spiritlessness of Philistine bourgeois mentality and its neo-pagan idolatry of, quote, some abstract universality, state and nation. Instead, Kierkegaard's focus now is squarely placed on what he calls, quote, the offense of Christianity, namely its uncompromising placement of, quote, the human individual be, uh, be, being before God and 
on the concepts of sin and despair. Neither modern apologetics, which as Kierkegaard uh, shows, defends Christianity in such a way that the offense has been removed, nor the rationalistic and historicist attempts to quote, deny Christ, any longer holds his interest. Indeed, as Joel Rasmussen points out, the later Kierkegaard stance no longer derives from, quote, a community and tradition of living narratives and practices. In other words, it no longer constitutes itself as a narrative of romantic building or as the type of dialectical movement that, as Terry Pinker has shown, shapes the emergent sociality of Hegelian Vernunft and Sittlichkeit. If the ultimatum of either or can be read as a blueprint for Kierkegaard's late writings, and I think Joel Rasmussen right to suggest that, it prefigures a language of radical Christian commitment perhaps not seen since Pascal. Building on provocative remarks from either or, such as that, quote, in relation to God, we are always in the wrong, and quote, that there is a Christian view that places everything under sin, knows no exception, spares nothing. Kierkegaard's late writings confront us on virtually every page with what Joel Rasmussen calls his, quote, radical sin consciousness. New and I think emphatically, notably, uh, very theological forebearers and successors now seem to replace Kierkegaard's earlier literary and philosophical interlocutors. I'm thinking of the late Augustine, of the neo-Augustinians at Port Royal, or one might say, looking forward, uh, that Kierkegaard's later stands presages of later rigorists, such as the young Karl Barth or Simone Weil. Joel Rasmussen rightly notes that what Kierkegaard, quote, regarded as true doctrine was, in fact, Christian doctrine. That said, I am less sure about his follow-up characterization of Kierkegaard's mature writings as, quote, both Socratically dialectical and confessionally Christian. I don't think it is possible to be both. Instead, I find the late works to have left genealogical and dialectical argumentation largely behind. The hyper-Augustinian psychology that takes shape after 1846 not only appears wary of tradition-based and dialectical models of narrative rationality, Kierkegaard here also seems to edge away from the genealog uh, genealogist's frantic efforts at out-narrating those very accounts. Perhaps by then he realized that like those narratives it wishes to dismantle, a genealogical approach is liable to turn into another of Kipling's just so bedtime stories, confirming, as Joel Rasmussen puts it, the story we want to tell rather than seeking to let history challenge and correct us. And yet, to be challenged and corrected by stories, to grasp them as parables about ourselves rather than seeking epistemic dominion over them is the true goal of Kierkegaardian Christianity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, you've given us a very uh, erudite response that engages deeply with uh, Joel's paper. So, We'll have our uh, other panelists join us in, in just a moment um, for wider discussion, but I'm sure that Joel will want to give at least an initial response um, to what Thomas has said. I assume so, correct me if I'm wrong, Joel. Yes, 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 please, that would be wonderful, thank you. Okay, and, start and us off with you, that. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Thomas, for a careful and very critical, I think, reading of my essay, um, although not um, ungenerous, that's true too. You've pushed me hard in places and you challenged me to articulate my view more fully and carefully in important respects. I certainly agree with you that uh, the language of the ultimatum prefigures a Christian commitment, um, likely not since, since Pascal. And I do concede that my concluding remarks concerning the implications of the ultimatum for how to read Kierkegaard's subsequent um, writings was all too brief. 
um, to that, I would I would observe that um, my essay was already over length, um, and and Kierkegaard's subsequent authorship is vast, as I said. Um, but that's that's a cop out. Um, I, I suppose I also think that um, at just fifteen pages of two volumes totaling eight hundred pages, the ultimatum itself is just a very brief hint at a larger hermeneutic for reading the later confessional. And and yes, I still think dialectical um, authorship. Um, and I hear clearly in your response that you think his later writings should be read. Um, I think you're saying only as confessional, but I think he envisions them working dialectically even in his later life. But let me come back to that. Um, I will respond first to your critique of my affiliation of Kierkegaard's esthete and seducer with what McIntyre calls that genealogical challenge. Um, I think I was not, I did not mean to portray, but perhaps I did. I think I was trying to portray, or rather I was not trying to portray directly here that Schlegel and his fellow romantics, ironists were effectively Nietzschean, but rather that contrary to what McIntyre argued, Kierkegaard's satire of romantic irony in and through his depiction of the aesthete and the seducer shows he had an, an anticipatory, anticipatory conception of something very like what he calls the genealogical challenge. And, and Kierkegaard's conception of romantic irony, whether or not, and, and it wouldn't be Schlegel's own self-conception, but Kierkegaard's conception of romantic irony is one of utter emptiness masquerading, at, masquerading as poetic self-creation and recreation. And just as McIntyre thinks the genealogists cannot consolidate themselves, so too Kierkegaard depicts, depicts the esthete and the seducer and romantic irony generally as ouroboric. In the concept of irony, he likens romantic ironists unto a witch consuming her own stomach. Um, so on my reading of either or, Kierkegaard thinks romantic irony amounts to a nihilism, very like what would soon be articulated as a Nietzschean outlook on my reading. Um, Kierkegaard may well have been unfair to Schlegel and others, as, as Donald Bartelm uh, says in an, in an essay called Kierkegaard Unfair to Schlegel, um, but at least the first volume does show, I think, the first volume of either or does show, I think, that he could envision something very like the genealogical challenge of Aunt La Lettre. Um, as for your point about Nietzsche envisioning himself, uh, 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 in himself envisioning a non-contingent truth as his telos, well, that may well be, but I still wonder whether uh, what Michael Gillespie calls Nietzsche's final teaching is from the Kierkegaardian perspective, and we only have the perspectives, I think, but from that Kierkegaardian perspective, infinitely and absolutely negative. So Zarathustra's abolition of morality, as you said, from the perspective, from the vantage point of truth, it seems to me both stands in a kind of paradoxical tension with Nietzsche's understanding of the will to truth, uh, will, to, will to truth masquerading as the will to power, and manifests what Kierkegaard using Hegel's phrase um, would have called this infinite absolute negativity with respect to truth. Uh, since for Kierkegaard, essential truth for us ultimately is a model and criterion for ethical religious Christian existence or life, namely the disclosure of that life in Jesus Christ. So now I am I'm back to the confession, confessional dimension of Kierkegaard's perspective. And you rightly paint, pointed out that I've offered only the barest intimation of that option. I am grateful to you for extending the discussion into the robustly normative account of Christian life uh, that we get in subsequent writings, as you mentioned, especially the Anticlimacus writings of the sickness unto death of 1849, practicing Christianity, 1850. Um, and here you observe, you find that he's left out the genealogical out narration and the dialectical argumentation. He's left those behind. Uh, 
Um, and since these works can be read as a confessional amplification of the ultimatum of either or, uh, without some internal representation of the other life stages, um, I, I do have a sense for what you mean. N nevertheless, I think those works are internally dialectical in a different respect in the way they discuss, for example, the relationship between the infinite and the finite, the relationship between the eternal and the temporal, between sin and grace. And I might still characterize the view displayed there as Socratically dialectical because Anticlimachus, like Kierkegaard, never comes to think of these contraries, uh, never comes to think these contraries can be mediated um, by knowledge. This, this is why Paul Ricoeur calls um, Kierkegaard, this is what Paul Ricoeur calls Kierkegaard's broken off dialectic of faith. And he distinguishes, distinguishes it from the Hegelian dialectic of rational mediation. And, and I think the point of this broken off dialectic is not to put, not to put, not put to apologetic ends. It's, it's never to try to demonstrate through argumentation that the incarnation of God in Christ can be understood. Its dialectical point is to demonstrate or to understand that it cannot be understood. And not just to throw one's hands up and show, say it cannot be understood, but show and understand that it cannot be understood. Um, but if that's not enough basis to claim that in his later authorship, Kierkegaard remained both Socratically Christian and confessionally, uh, Socratically dialectical and confessionally Christian, I think we might also look at what else Kierkegaard was publishing in these years. In 1849, the year he published um, The Sickness Unto Death, he also published uh, The Lily of the Field and The Bird of the Air. On that very day, he published the second edition of Either Or. And I think this decision, why well, take it this, de this decision on his part, can be taken to suggest that in orchestrating the intertextual dialectic of his authorship, he was intimating something like, these are to be read together, for self-examination and then judge for yourself, which happened to be two other titles he published subsequently. Um, and then in the point of view for my work as an author, which wasn't published in his lifetime, um, it was published four years after he died, um, he speaks of this feature in the authorship of on the one hand, on the other hand, as a dialectical redoubling of an authorship in which the equivocalness is maintained. And in his journals, reflecting on the challenge he found on how best to publish, to bring um, these Anticlimachus works into the world, so not to represent himself to his readers as an extraordinary Christian, he again resorted to a pseudonym so that these works could come into the world, in his words, uh, poetically, without authority. Um, and, and he says, this is because I am no apostle or the like, I am, a, I am a poetical dialectical genius, personally and religiously a penitent. So I think he still thinks it sees himself as holding the confessional and the dialectical together, even if within, within those anticlimacus writings, we don't, we see primarily the confessional. So I think I might've gone on too long again. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, well, thank you, Joel, for that response. Uh, we're joined now by um, panelists who will be speaking more to us uh, later today. So we have Cyril O'Regan, uh, Judith Wolf, and Ragnar Miski Bergam. Um, so we'll be uh, hearing from you, you guys, as to what you thought of the paper. Thomas, if you want to respond at all briefly to Joel, um, that would also be fine. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, much of what uh, Joel just said, sort of in elaboration of, of points that were not fully fleshed out in the paper, I find also very helpful and, and persuasive. I think it is right that the late Kierkegaard is sort of proceeding on two tracks and perhaps doesn't quite um, 
uh, resolve whether these two tracks, the Socratic and the confessional, are ultimately commensurable or not. So perhaps an uh, issue that uh, is, you know, that is, can only be worked out based on the individual performances of the writings themselves. Um, so that in a way, what I highlight there may be ultimately some misgivings I would have about that aspect of his work rather than the argument that Joe presented about it. Um, on, um, on the, uh, I mean, one of the other things that I would just note is that the romantic irony in the way that Schlegel discusses it in which, you know, um, Joel so very nicely contextualized for us again in the way that Kierkegaard came to think about it, that critique is of course to a certain extent already anticipated in Hegel's lectures on aesthetics. Um, and so it seems to me that uh, Kierkegaard here is actually um, clearly uh, informed by this, um, by Hegel's view of romantic irony as a kind of grundlose, uh, un, uh, groundless um, and endlessly performative uh, stance which um, in a way, and that's Hegel's main critique, I, at least I take it to be, ultimately fails to notice just how much incipient nihilism it contains, this Schlegelian model. Um, that I think uh, it's there that, Hegel, uh, that Kierkegaard's sort of confessional persona is already showing signs of rebellion against that, that kind of strictly performative uh, model of, of being in the world. Um, in part, and that's why I sort of brought in Goethe and, and Mozart actually in particular, because uh, you can, you know, it is of course uh, endlessly entertaining to, to read accounts in this manner by Schlegel or for that matter Cervantes, but it's actually very hard to uh, have anything like a human community that would be predicated on such a model. And that's, I think, what troubles Hegel as much as it troubles Kierkegaard. Uh, Sch uh, Schlegelian irony, and with its uh, nihilist or proto-nihilist undertow, uh, would spell disaster for the possibility of an ethical community. It just would never result in one. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Thank you. And I agree with hey, you. Well, I Welcome uh, Cyril or Judith or Ragnar to um, weigh in on it. We've, we've had a wide ranging discussion already. Um, we're open to comments and questions from the rest of the panel. Cyril may be muted, I think. I think Thomas raises an issue, which I think he also kind of modified. That is that we do have to make at least an analytic distinction uh, between genealogy and Kekigar and confession. The question thereafter sort of is whether sort of we're going to assign an absolute rupture and you know, when we assign that absolute rupture. I think Thomas modified uh, in his remarks what tended to be a kind of punctiliar dislocation between these two genres in Kierkegaard. And personally, I'm glad that he did. Because it seems to me, if we look at the work as a whole, what we're dealing with, I think, are different dominant recessive relationships between genealogy and confession. If we look sort of at those words which might appear to be on the surface entirely genealogical, let's say like either or. We still have to ask the question as to what the purpose of this excavation of mentalities is. And the purely kind of destructive or deconstructive way in which Kierkegaard goes about his business in which we have, let's say in either or, I think two different kinds of loser before we get to confession. I mean, Judge William is a loser too. He's just not the same kind of loser uh, as the AST. So what's going on sort of is, it seems to me, a clearing out of mentalities 
which are not going to simply make difficult, but make impossible uh, real genuine Christian religiousness. So I would, I would kind of argue that um, on the side, we actually, so therefore I think the confession does make sense. On the side so that we have through all of these texts, uh, what the purpose of, what the purpose of the detonations, uh, what the purpose of the irony is. And then when we get to the other side, wherever we put the other side, that is the more confessional works. It is the case that Kierkegaard is certainly sort of in the mental zone of, uh, I can't only do genealogy, I must actually now come due. I mean, payment is due with respect to what I wanted to say and what I want a Christian to be and what I want a Christian so to perform. But I don't think it's ever sort of without an understanding um, of actually what the current situation is going to be in any event. And actually what the current uh, situation, not in terms of the possibility of religion, but the actuality of religion in Denmark is. In other words, you know, how sort of my particular version um, of Christianity is going to relate to Martinson, who's the bishop. So I would I regard the later work as not ungenealogical, except the focus becomes ecclesial and ecclesiastical specifically. And in that sense, genealogy never goes, but high culture genealogy, he's been there, he's done that. And for the intellectual elite, he has indicated that they have a fundamental choice to make. Um, whichever sort of of these Copenhagen cultural options that are on the table and which are alluring and have attraction. He wants to say that, that you cannot have your ethical cake, judge Willem, and eat it. You cannot have your aesthetic cake and eat it and be religious and so forth. That done. Question then, I think, sort of is more ecclesial issue. What is the, what is the best kind of reading uh, of scripture, for instance? How troubling or untroubling is the reading of scripture? What does scripture perform? When is, when is the Bible scripture, when it is not, when is it read not as scripture, et cetera, and so forth. I think it's a different set of issues. Joel, do you wanna come back on that one? Um, I, I, I'm very attracted to everything you've observed there, Cyril. Um, I would have a question. I'm not sure entirely how you're using the word genealogical with respect to the excavation later in, in, in his life. Uh, I'd be interested to hear that. So I was arguing that it's still dialectical, um, but post-genealogical. But maybe maybe you can push back and, and, and show me how it remains genealogical in a certain respect. Uh, Joel, I think you actually have a point. Um, so I, I, would, I, I think sort of I would prefer to play for a draw on this one. Uh, so I, so I, think, I think you're right. Quite clearly, uh, the point I made was that uh, the genealogy, and let's suppose at the moment I continue to defend it with respect to the later work, in any event, is going to look different. Right. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, sort of it is not sort of going to go deep. In other words, it's not necessarily going sort of to. Uh, do sort of a kind of excavation sort of of the layers of cultural consciousness and dismiss them sort of you know, from sort of you know, uh, religious aptitude, which is what I, I think genealogy is. Mm -hmm. The later is an exercise, I suppose, when I would call ecclesiology or what is a church, what is a community. Uh, and it may very well be sort of that what you're saying is what I'm kind of calling a, a genealogy, you know, by sort of a different stroke or I would even say a genealogy sort of in a minor key. I'm, I would be prepared, I think, an argument uh, to sort of concede that, well, you know, a genealogy in a minor key doesn't look terribly different from dialectic. And at that particular point, I think we might be talking sort of about words. So I think that that sort of uh, is my concession speech, I think, on that particular point. Um, Judith or Ragnar, any uh, comments from you? Yeah, can I come in on uh, Thomas's response and particularly on the, the wider claims that Thomas made beyond Kierkegaard and his response? I'd be interested in hearing more from you, Thomas. It sounded to me as if you're suggesting that, um, the, uh, that a consciousness of sin, that Kierkegaard's very pervasive consciousness of sin, um, 
draws the floor from under a particular kind of genealogy because many of our genealogies have the purpose in a sense of alternative accounts of fall, of decline or of progress. In other words, they pose alternatives to a thoroughgoing account of human sinfulness. Uh, if that's the case, do you have a sense of what, if at all, the normative function of genealogy should be um, within a Christian account where sin is dominant, or whether you think that you know genealogy shouldn't shouldn't play a normative role because actually sin is what we should be focusing on, not narratives of decline or of progress. Uh, yeah, excellent uh, question, Judith. Um, I suppose I would say that. Um, inside any traditional, or that's a paradoxical way of putting it, inside the kind of Nietzschean genealogist or anyone working in that mode uh, is a certain slumbers, a certain kind of Pelagian confidence that the genealogical project is always going to be circumscribed by a view of life as, as absolutely imminent and self-defining and that's where the confidence, the sort of, you know, in Nietzsche's case, it's a kind of Pelagianism on steroids. Um, the, the difference is that uh, Kierkegaard, in a way, I think, focuses, uh, I mean, there is a certain way in which his writing retains the genealogical uh, uh, sort of pathos, but it now focuses squarely on our uh, persistent failure, perhaps the, the, the one thing that actually unifies all Christians uh, in Kierkegaard's view is that they tend to be bad Christians, that, that Christianity is largely a history of self-betrayal. Um, and that uh, 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 with you know, a figure like Bishop Munster, so you know, being uh, a kind of unwitting Judas of sorts, um, that, that there is a kind of way in which um, what really needs to be exposed is our utter and persistent failure to respond to the offense of Christianity as Kierkegaard later comes to understand it. In that sense, I think he, he is, and of course this uh, argument has certainly been made in, in detail by others, he is really a, a so fascinating uh, heir apparent of William Blake. Uh, for whom in many ways that is also the focus of his illuminated works, which is to essentially show the utter failure of, um, uh, of um, established uh, forms of Christianity, particularly, of course, Anglicanism, uh, but not just, um, to really uh, honor the, the meaning of the Gospels and the confessional dimension that, that should be front and center. And that... Um, the best thing one can hope for uh, is to become excessively or fully self-aware of one's sinfulness. Um, so there is, in that sense, there is a kind of genealogical unmasking of Christianity, as I would put it, as a, as a kind of uh, long, you know, two millennia long history of self-betrayal. And that, that impulse in a way s stays. Um, so, uh, in that sense, the genealogical and the confessional, the dialectical and the confessional can actually be and uh, can be said to remain fruitfully aligned in, in Kierkegaard, uh, as indeed they are also in Blake. Uh, but the, the, the conception of uh, uh, genealogy as a purely imminent project, one of, of sort of, you know, um, unfettered self-assertion, um, that I think is, is something that uh, pretty much is laid to rest after uh, either or. Joel, I'm wondering as we are um, approaching the hour mark here, uh, if you would be willing to give us a sort of idiot's guide to your paper summary um, of what McIntyre's sort of false dilemma misses out. I mean, you're saying that it's not just Nietzsche or Aristotle, there's also Kierkegaard, who McIntyre mentions, but doesn't read terrifically well. Um, would you be willing to give us a sort of capsule summary of what we can draw from Kierkegaard um, that you think is valuable? Well, oh, 
what we can draw from queer code that we think is valuable. Um, well, I, in, in the coda part that I mentioned, I tried to suggest that if what, what is desired, if what McIntyre wants is tradition informed by the dialectic of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, conf the confession of the Augustinian tradition that Thomas has so uh, rightly underscored here, um, and a willingness to move back and forth between them in conversation with them, um, then in modernity, he, sh he could do no better really than Kierkegaard, whom he in fact relegates more than any other figure really in the, in the history of theology and philosophy. Kierkegaard's either or is made to speak for um, what he calls Kierkegaard's doctrine. And this is characterized as the outcome and epitaph of the Enlightenment project. Um, so he, he in fact, he, he missed, and what he could have learned then is that his own Aristotelian and then Thomistic view uh, is actually nowhere near as critical of, of the sinfulness of modernity and Christendom generally. And he could have learned that his overconfidence is in fact fairly easily uh, uh, affiliable with uh, William's own um, 